All right, if you would, turn again in your Bible tonight to Galatians. I want to finish what I started this morning. This morning the theme was this. We pointed out how the book of Galatians, just this one book alone, refutes many of the errors of hyper-extreme dispensationalism. Now again, I remind you that dispensationalism is just one of many, many methods of Bible study and interpretation. It was created, that method was created by men to promote and advance their private doctrines and private theories about the Bible. And being created by men, dispensationalism, like all the other methods of Bible study, is not inspired, it's not infallible, and it's not sacred. There are mistakes and errors in it, and they need to be pointed out. And nobody's doing it. And so I, I chose to do it. Now, again, we don't throw out the baby with the bath water. We don't say that all of it is wrong, because it's not. Dispensationalism um, is good about separating law and grace, uh, separating the Old and New Covenant, and emphasizing salvation by grace and security. That's the good points of it. But right alongside of all these truths, there's a whole lot of error. And to rightly divide the word of truth means to separate truth from error. And it's amazing how this one book, the book of Galatians, refutes many of the theories of extreme hyperdispensationalism. Now, I'm not going to reteach what I've already taught, but I'll just go over them real quickly for those who were not here this morning. Dispensationalism teaches that the church began with Paul. Galatians says otherwise. In Galatians 1.13, Paul said he persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So how could the church of God, which is Christ's body, begin with Paul when Paul persecuted it before he was saved? Dispensationalism teaches that Peter and Paul preached two different gospels. Galatians proves that's wrong in Galatians 1. Paul said, if anybody preaches a gospel contrary to the one I preach, he said, let God curse him. Now, would God send Peter to preach a gospel that contradicted Paul when God said, I'll curse the man that does it? It's not going to happen. They had to preach the same gospel. And they use that verse. You know, Paul, Paul said he preached the gospel, the uncircumcision, and Peter the circumcision gospel. Let's say, see there, that proves they preached two different gospels. Well, Paul preached the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of peace, the gospel of grace. Does that mean he preached four or five different gospels? Of course not. They're all different names for the same gospel. And we know that the message, and this is what's important, the message of the gospel, the uncircumcision and circumcision is the same by comparing what Paul actually preached when he preached the gospel of the uncircumcision and what Peter actually preached. And we ran the verses. They both preached the sacrificial death and resurrection of Christ for sins. Same message. The audience is what made it different. Paul spent most of his time amongst Gentiles, Peter amongst the Jews. That's the only difference. The message is the same. Dispensationalism teaches that Paul preached salvation by grace, but Peter preached salvation by works. Galatians 2.21 refutes that idea because in that verse he said, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That verse tells you very plainly that nobody could preach the cross and works at the same time. If they did, they would frustrate God's grace, but number two, make the cross of no effect and vain. Well, both Peter and Paul preached the cross. Therefore, they could not and did not preach works. If Peter preached works like a lot of dispensationalists say, then he made the cross of none effect, and he cursed himself according to Galatians chapter 1. 
also dispensationalism teaches that that uh, that Peter was justified by works, but Paul was justified by grace. Well, in Galatians two sixteen, Paul says that both he and Peter were justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. And verse sixteen, as you know from verse fourteen possibly to the end of the chapter, is a conversation between Paul and Peter. He said, I said unto Peter before them all. And so he starts, and he tells us what he told Peter. And he got to verse 16 of chapter 2. He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ, even we, me and you, Peter, have been justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. He used that word we, we, we throughout those verses speaking of himself and Peter. Also, dispensationalism teaches that Paul preached eternal security, but Peter did not. Well, Galatians 2.21 refutes that again. Because when you preach the cross... You cannot preach works to get saved or works to stay saved. The cross eliminates works, good or bad, out of the picture when it comes to getting saved and staying saved. You see, those today who say you can lose your salvation, they say you lose it because of failure of maintaining good works. Well, works don't play have any part in salvation, the cross eliminates the works. See, we're not only saved by the cross, we're kept saved by the cross. And so if you're going to preach the cross, you're not only going to have to preach salvation by the cross, but security by the cross as well. And not only that, but I say this again, when men, and, and I'm convinced of it, that a lot of folks today the claim they know what the gospel is, don't really know what it is. You ask, well, what's the gospel? They say, well, Christ died for your sins, was buried, raised again. Well, that's what Paul said, but what did God do to Christ when Christ died for our sins? And they do get a blank look on their face. They don't realize what really happened. What really happened is that God condemned Christ for our sins on the cross, as if He committed the sin instead of us, God punished Christ for our sins on the cross, as if we were guilty of the sins instead of Christ. And God poured out His wrath against our sins on Christ on the cross, as if we committed the sins instead of Him. Now, if that's true, could God then turn around and condemn us punish us eternally, or pour out His wrath on us when He's already poured it out on Christ in our behalf. And that doesn't register with people. They don't understand it. But it's real simple. Once, once the sentence of a crime has been paid, that person cannot be, cannot be forced to pay the penalty again. If a man is sentenced to 10 years in prison, he serves 10 years, he gets out, the state cannot put him back in jail again for that crime and punish him again 10 years more in the jailhouse. Once the 10 years is up, his sentence is paid for. He walks out a free man. Well, in our case, Jesus died for all of our crimes and sins, past, present, future, paid for them in full, God counts His death as our death. And because of that, God cannot condemn us eternally for our sins because He's already condemned Christ. He cannot pour out His wrath on us for our sins because He's already poured out it out on Christ. That's what, people, that's what the apostles preach when they preach the cross. Folks, that's security. You are secure because of the cross. The cross declares what you deserve, Jesus suffered. And God can't turn around and punish you for what He's already punished Christ for or condemn you for what He's already condemned Christ for. The cross takes care of it. So, I guarantee you Peter preached security just as much as Paul. Let me give you 
Let me give you a little illustration here to, to show you how absurd it is to say that Paul preached security and Peter did not. Let's say that you go to work for a man tomorrow and you and another man are the only employees he has, all right? He tells one man, he says, now I want you to dig a hole in the ground. And so he starts digging. And he tells you, he says, as soon as that man digs that hole in the ground, I want you to fill it back up. Now, what would you think about a boss like that? You would say, this guy needs to, you know, he needs to take his medicine. <laughs> he needs pills. He needs to see a doctor. Something's wrong. You don't hire a man to dig a hole and then hire another man to fill it right back up, do you? That don't make sense. Well, how in the world... Or well, why in the world would, how could God send Paul? Paul, I want you to go and I want you to preach eternal security. I want you to tell people that, that once they believe on me, their salvation is secure. But Peter, I want you to go and I want you to warn people that if they're not careful, they can lose their salvation. You see how absurd that is? How would you like to have been living back there in that day? You heard Paul preaching security. You hear, you hear Peter preaching you can lose it. Who are you going to believe? Both of them are apostles. Both sent by God. It wouldn't make sense with it. What kind of God? That's a God of confusion. And I'm telling you what. The God of dispensationalism is a God of confusion. The very idea he would send two men to preach two different and opposing gospels and one man to preach security and another man to say you can lose at the same time, that's, that's wacky. But the, that thought never enters people's minds. Also, dispensationalism teaches that prior to Paul, men were saved by keeping the law. That's the general teaching heard it all my life. Saved by keeping the law. Galatians refutes that. In Galatians 3.11, he says we're not justified, nobody is justified by the law. Galatians 3.21, he says the law could not give eternal life and the righteousness of God was not imputed to a man who kept the law. So three strikes against the law in Galatians. It can't justify, it cannot give eternal life, God's righteousness is not imputed to those who keep it. And in Hebrews chapter 10, Paul talked about the sacrifice of the law. He said it is not possible that those sacrifices should take away sin. Well, if all that's true, how is it possible for a man to be saved by the law? It can't give eternal life, how can you be saved? It can't justify, how can you be saved? If it can't give you God's righteousness, how can you be saved? And if it can't take away sins, how in the world can a person be saved? Impossible. You say, well, how were they saved? We talked about today, you know, same way Abraham was. Genesis 15, he believed God, it was counted unto him for righteousness. All right, something else. Dispensationalism teaches that Paul did not preach the new birth and that nobody is born again today. But in Galatians 4, 29, Paul said that people were born again. Some of his, con his converts were born again. And they were persecuted by those who were born once. And we talked about that today. Now, here's where we pick up tonight. Dispensationalism teaches us that God never promised to save heathen, pagan, idol-worshiping Gentiles like us today. They say that the prophets prophesied and promised to save Gentiles who became Jewish proselytes. Galatians refutes that error. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3.7 Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, the heathen, notice that, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, as you know by now in this church, we've done we've gone through this verse many times. In that verse, Paul is quoting a promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 22, 18. 
He's to see, said to Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the nations, plural, be blessed. In thy seed shall all the nations be blessed. Well, he doesn't really clarify or define what that promise means. But Paul does. And he shows us right here that those nations that God promised to bless included heathen Gentile nations. That's the word he used, isn't it? And in Galatians chapter 3, he tells us who that seed was. In verse 16, is Christ. And right here in verse 8, he shows us what the blessing is. He said, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Well, the blessing is what? Justification through faith, verse 8. So God did indeed promise to save heathen Gentiles like you and I way back in Genesis 22.18. Paul lays it out, describes it in detail right here in Genesis chapter 3. See, he quotes Genesis 22.18 and he defines it. And by the way, Peter also quoted Genesis 22.18 in the last couple of verses of Acts 3. But when he quotes the verse, he interprets the nations as Jews. And it does. When Paul quotes the verse, he interprets the nations as heathen Gentiles. And it's true. It's it's all nations. Jew, Gentile, were all promised to be justified by faith in Christ, the seed of Abraham. Written right back down there in Genesis chapter 22. I mean, when I first saw that, I jumped up out of the seat of such a blessing. I, <clears throat> isn't it wonderful to see a new truth? Man, that's like giving candy to a baby. All right, something else. When we talked about this, I won't go, belay, uh, go through it again, but dispensationalism teaches that the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, is Israel's promise. They say, well, why is that? It says, they say, because their names are on the gates and the twelve apostles' names are on the foundation. But yet in Galatians 4.26, Paul said that Jerusalem which is above is free, the mother of us all. The mother of us all. So we do indeed have hope and inheritance in the heavenly city, New Jerusalem. And Paul writes about it in the book of Hebrews, describes the occupants of it, and John describes it better than anyone in the book of Revelation. Now, something else we didn't discuss today, but we have in in the past. We'll do it again. Dispensationalism teaches that out there in the future, that God is going to change the gospel of grace and send men to preach salvation by works. I've heard that all my life. Hear people still preaching that today. God's going to change the gospel. And it's not going to be grace anymore. It's going to be works. Well, Galatians chapter 1 refutes that. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that call you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You know, you look at that verse and you shake your head, don't you? Because Paul was the one that started the churches of Galatia in chapter 13 and 14 of Acts. But soon after he left, the Judaizers came in and convinced them that Paul's a bad man. They convinced him, Paul's not your friend. He's your enemy. You listen to us. And what do they do? Put him back right back under the law. That's what they did. It, and it's happened soon. You know, with a preacher, you teach somebody something over and over again, and they nod their head in approval. And then, maybe a year later, you find out that that person is doing just the opposite of what they agreed to or said they believed. Isn't that amazing? And you just say, what in the world happened to this person? And that's why Paul said, I stand in doubt of you. Verse 7, which is not another, 
but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, and Paul puts himself right there, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a cursing. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man, any man is every man, including the twelve or anybody now or future. It's not just now. It's future. If any man preach any other gospel in you than you have received, let him be accursed. Paul said, if any man right now or future preaches a gospel other than the one that he preached, he is accursed of God. Folks, will does God send men today to preach salvation by works? Of course not. He sends them to preach the gospel of grace. Well, is He going to send men to preach a gospel of works in the future? It'll never happen. It'll never happen. If a man preaches works in the future, God will curse him just like He'll curse a man that does it today. Don't ever doubt that for one second. The gospel's not going to change. It stays the same. Period. Matter of fact, there's only been one gospel, period, throughout the Bible anyway. Paul said Christ died for your sins according to what? The Scriptures. What Scriptures? The Old Testament Scriptures. It was there in the Old Testament. It's in Matthew, Mark, and John. It's in Acts. It's in the Pauline epistles. It's in the Hebrew epistles. It's all the way through the Bible. It's a gospel of grace. Now, it's a gospel of grace in the future. It's a gospel of grace forever. It's an everlasting gospel. All right, something else. Dispensationalism teaches that the twelve apostles, they were the kingdom preachers, not Paul. And they say that the church, that, that those converts of Peter and the twelve, they were kingdom saints. And the twelve apostles were kingdom preachers. Whereas they say, Paul didn't preach the kingdom like the twelve, and the church today is not a kingdom church, we're the body of Christ. Well, Galatians refused that. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Now folks, these verses are written to the Galatians. Not somebody else, to the Galatians and us. Verse 19, 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There it is. Now Paul speaks about the kingdom of God as an inheritance. It's an inheritance. It's the inheritance that you receive when you believe the gospel. And I'll tell you what, if you don't have an inheritance in the kingdom of God, the only alternative is the lake of fire. I tell you what, I'm scared of these people who say, the kingdom ain't got nothing to do with me. Well, get ready to, get ready to, to suffer some fire then, friend. <laughs> uh, look, keep your hand in Galatians and go back to Acts 20. You know, you've got to think about this, folks. People today, most people believe what they believe because of what they've heard. And they just simply mouth what someone has told them to say. They've heard somebody say it, and they repeat it, assuming it must be right. And this idea that Paul did not preach the kingdom is ridiculous. Do you realize the Apostle Paul preached the kingdom more than any apostle? More than all of them. In Acts 14, he preached the gospel. he's preaching the kingdom of God. By the way, when you preach the kingdom of God, you're preaching the gospel. 
What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Is not the kingdom of God good news? I guarantee it is. In Acts 20, where well, we're going to read right, well, in Acts 19, I should say, he preached the kingdom of God. In Acts 20, he's preaching the kingdom of God. And in Acts 28, he found him preaching the kingdom of God twice. As a matter of fact, in Acts 28, the last verse, 31, uh, Luke said that Paul uh, had a hired house for two years, received all that came unto him, preaching the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. His, he ended his ministry preaching about the kingdom of God. But notice this in Acts 20. In Acts 20, 24, But none of these things move me, that is, suffering, right, uh, suffering uh, bonds and afflictions. Neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now most dispensations stop reading right there. But look at the next verse. And now behold I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. When Paul preached the gospel of grace, he preached the kingdom of God. When he preached the kingdom of God, he preached the gospel of grace. You know why? Because the kingdom of God is the inheritance you receive when you believe the gospel of grace. Of course Paul preached the kingdom. Every apostle preached the kingdom. I preach it, and I hope you do too. Now back to Galatians again. Dispensationalism teaches that the new covenant, that pertains to Israel, not the church. You say, why do you say that? They say, well, because the new covenant was made with Israel. The promise was made to them. Well, that's true. Jeremiah 31. He made it with the house of Israel. And so they say, well, we have no claim to it. Well, there's a lot of things wrong with that. And one thing that's wrong with it is that you and I today are partakers of Israel's spiritual things. And one of them is the new covenant. But notice Galatians chapter 4, 21. Galatians 4, 21. He said, tell me, Ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? And the answer is they didn't. They wasn't listening. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. The one by bondmaid, his bondmaid. The other by a free woman, that's Sarah. Two sons, two wives. Verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman, Ishmael, was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman, that's Isaac, born of the free woman, Sarah, was by promise. Isaac was the promised seed. He is the seed. Uh, God, God told Abraham, your seed will multiply one day and be as the stars of heaven for number. But for him to have the multiplied seed, he had to have one. <laughs> And the one was Isaac. He was the promised seed, not Ishmael. See, that's where these Muslims got it wrong. They claimed to be Abraham's seed through Ishmael. They claim Ishmael was the child of promise, but he wasn't. He was of the flesh. 24. Which things are an allegory? Okay, what we're reading here is an allegory, a type or figure of something. For these are the two covenants, old and new covenant. The one from the Mount Sinai, which generateth to bondage, which is Agar, the handmaid. For this Agar, Abraham's handmaid, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. See, she's like Mount Sinai. What happened on Sinai? That's where the law was given. And answer is to Jerusalem, which now is earth of Jerusalem, and is in bondage with her children. I'm reading about an allegory of the two covenants. <clears throat> 
On one side, you've got Agar, the handmaid of Abraham, and Ishmael, Mount Sinai, where the law was given, and the earthly Jerusalem. Those four items right there represent Old Covenant law. That's what they represent. They're an allegory of it. Verse 26, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So on the other hand, you've got Sarah and Isaac and New Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, representing the new covenant in the allegory. For it is, for it is written, Rejoice thou barren, Sarah, that bearest not for a long time she couldn't. Bring forth and cry, Thou that travailest not, for the desolate Sarah hath many more children than she which hath an husband. And what he's simply saying to me is that Sarah, a type of the new covenant, has more children than Agar, a type of the old covenant, and that's true. In other words, there's more new covenant saints than old. You know why? Because the new covenant is an everlasting covenant. It never ends. The law did. So it was, a, it was limited. But the new covenant is unlimited because it's an everlasting covenant. So there's more children, more people say, new covenant saints than old. And you can see what Paul's doing. He's putting himself in the ranks of the new covenant saints. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. We are the children. Just like Isaac was a, was a promise to Abraham, we are the children that were promised to Abraham. You see, it was... God told Abraham, your seed, children, will be as the stars of heaven for number. That's us. That's you and I. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. God made that promise to Abraham, your seed will be as the stars of heaven. Well, you know what? You're one of them right now. You ever felt like a star? Well, you are. <laughs> but as then... He that was born out of the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him that was born out of the spirit, Isaac, and Ishmael did persecute Isaac, didn't he? He says, even so it is now, present tense. Paul's writing to people who were born of the spirit. Who are they? The new covenant saints. They're born of the spirit. And they were being persecuted by those born of the flesh only. And the majority of them were the Jews who were not born again. You know why they were not born again? They didn't think a second birth was necessary. They thought that, well, I'm Abraham's seed. That's my ticket. One birth. And they were of the flesh. But other people believed on Christ and were born the second time by the Spirit and they were being persecuted by the Jews born to the flesh only. It was going on in Paul's day. And it still goes on even today. If you don't believe that, go to Jerusalem right now and try to preach the gospel. On the street corner. They'll come get you. <laughs> Verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, the law, old covenant, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, O covenant saints, or of Agar, but of the free, Sarah. We're the promised seed. And then he says, next verse, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Folks, it's so obvious to me. This is an allegory of the two covenants, old and new. And Paul takes his side with the new covenant saints. He says, Jerusalem above is the mother of us all. Something else about Galatians. Dispensationalists teach that Israel today is completely fallen and cast away. Galatians disagrees with that. Look, if you would, to Galatians 6, 15. 6, 15. He said, For in Christ Jesus, 
neither in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, no uncircumcision, but a new creature. But as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them in mercy and upon the Israel of God. That verse tells you it's obvious that all of Israel was not cast away. See, the problem with dispensationalism, and I see it all the time, is that it's like a reaction to a word. You mention Israel to them, what do they think? That nation over there in the Middle East. But folks, that nation in the Middle East, that is not the Israel of God. Now, the Israel of God may live amongst them. I'm sure there are believers in Jerusalem today who believe in Christ. You see, what the dispensation can't get in his mind is that there, there always has been two Israels. And will always be two Israels. You know, in Romans 11, Paul said that Israel is blinded, cast off, cast away. You know what? There's always been a group of Jews blinded, cut off, and cast away all the way through the Old Testament. But then he says... <clears throat> There was an election of grace. Who are they? Those that believed. And you know what? There's always been that election. There's always been a remnant of Jews throughout history who have believed God and will always be. And Paul calls them the Israel of God. There are two Israels. There's that blinded bunch and then there's that elected bunch that were believed on Christ, were saved, and they're with us today. There's not many of them. If you just make the Israel of God... Believing Jews only is a small remnant. Now, some people say, well, we will be included in the Israel of God today. I don't argue with people about that. If we are, that's fine. It's okay with me. But folks don't ever get the idea that all of Israel is fallen and cast away. That's why Paul said that blindness in part, in part, not in whole, in part has happened to Israel. There is an Israel of God in Paul's day. There is one today. The real ones. The genuine. Now one more thing. Dispensationalism teaches that, that no one preached what Paul preached before him. They say that everything that Paul preached was brand new. Nobody ever heard about it before. Well, Galatians refutes that. Look at Galatians 1, 21. He said, Afterward I came into the region of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face under the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past, Paul, now preaches the faith which he once destroyed. So what did Paul preach when God saved him? The faith that he once destroyed. So he's preaching the truth, the very truth that he once hated and despised and rejected. So did Paul preach something new? No. He preached the faith that he once destroyed. And you know what? You read the Pauline epistles and read them carefully. And I've counted it. I've counted at least 60 church doctrines in the Pauline epistles that Paul preached and wrote about that are based on the Old Testament scriptures. <clears throat> he once destroyed them, but then he began to preach them and write about them. The gospel itself, he once destroyed. Justification by faith, righteousness by faith, the new covenant, freedom from the law. Those are the things that Paul fought against prior to being saved. But what he fought against, he began to advocate and preach later on. He preached the faith that he once destroyed. That verse used to really, really give me problems because I had this idea in my head with Paul. He preached what nobody else did. That's not true at all. Now, there's no doubt about it, and I've, you know this. Paul took many doctrines in the Old Testament and he blew them up more fully in, the, in, in his epistles, right? It's like that verse in Genesis twenty two eighteen. 18. God said, Abraham, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. 
Well, you go back there and read that and just, just pretend like you never read the New Testament. And you say to yourself, well, what does this mean? It's there. It's black and white. What does it mean? Paul blows it up. I mean, he expands it in Galatians chapter 3. And that's true of many doctrines. Paul took the Old Testament and explained it probably better than anyone in the New Testament. That's, that was his ministry. I say that everything that Paul preached can be found in the Old Testament, including the so-called mystery of Ephesians chapter 3. It's written down back there, but nobody, there's, you know, we, you know what a mystery is. A mystery is not a mystery because it's not written down prior to revelation. No, a mystery is a secret that God writes down in black and white, but He keeps it a secret from the understanding of men until He chooses the right time, place, and man to reveal it to. It's back there, but nobody understands it until over here in the New Testament. And that's the way it is with many of Paul's doctrines. He lays out doctrines, explains them fully, that are not so full in the Old Testament. But nevertheless, those are just examples of how the one book, the book of Galatians, six chapters, destroys many of the extreme doctrines of hyper-extreme dispensationalism. And I emphasize that extreme hyper-dispensationalism because when I first got saved back in 1966, I went to a church, Dr. Henry Gruby, all you people know him, you've heard him preach. He was a dispensationalist, but he was a sane dispensationalist. Let's put it that way. That's the way I called him. And that's the way it was in those days. And those men back in those days, they didn't teach this kind of wild stuff you hear today. They emphasized salvation by grace, eternal security. They emphasized freedom from the law, and we're under grace. And those things need to be taught. That same dispensationalism. But this idea that God sent two men to preach two different opposing gospels and doctrines at the same time, where did that come from? It didn't come from God or the Bible. No, sir. That came from somewhere else. It came from a pit. That's where that came from. So, again, we say we're not throwing the, the baby out with the bath water altogether. See, some, one of the problems that people have, and I've seen it happen many times, people see the errors of dispensationalism and they go to the other extreme, on the way on the other extreme, from dis, they get as far as away from it as they can. And they get involved in some other wacko stuff over here. Got to be what? Balanced. Balance it out. You know, weigh the evidence and balance have a balanced ministry. The truth is always somewhere in the middle. And I've heard Brother Troy say that, and he's right about that. That's a good saying. All right, thank you all for coming tonight.